maps uh, from their earliest ones we know are, have any number of different purposes. Of course, they're informational, they're public informational, a good way to know how to get from where to where, of course. Uh, many were also highly political. The state or the city of the sponsor or the patron of whoever made the map tended to be at the middle of the world. And this was a way of saying in that Ozymandias type of way how great and powerful they were. Uh, there were also, of course, maps that were secret maps uh, that had commercial or military applications from the very beginning. But also from the very beginning, almost from the very beginning, in literally a flight of imagination, many maps looked down from a bird's eye view as a way of expressing how things related to one another. Map making changed forever after overhead mapping reconnaissance became available basically in the First World War as biplanes were used to take pictures or send observers up to look at the trenches over France and Belgium during the First World War. Then, of course, in the 1950s, that changed again when satellites became possible taking pictures. Well, we'd like to think they were taking pictures of the new interstate highway system. They were, in fact, taking pictures of the submarine pens in Murmansk and missile silos in Novosibirsk. Uh, first the Corona and later the Keyhole satellite series. And they changed, well, national technical means of verification uh, became an expression that those of us who were involved in a lot of uh, uh, arms control issues became familiar with, meaning we take pictures from very high up, some of them very, very good. Uh, it is interesting, I mentioned the keyhole satellites. Michael first started a company called, well, interestingly, Keyhole. And it was using secret information, once secret information, for an entirely different purpose. And I wanted to ask you about the genesis of Google Earth. Google Earth really started at my dining room table. And uh, there were three of us, we wrote this thing, uh, and we thought that it would be fun, so we did it. Uh, we had built bigger systems before that did an even better job, but they were only used in classified applications. And we said, you know, that, that missile silo, that's what the president needs to know, but my mother needs to know, like, is the Hilton really at the beach, or can you just see the beach with a telescope? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, the practical questions. Same idea, but a different application. So we did that, and uh, through a lot of twists and turns, it ended up uh, that we sold that company to Google, uh, because Larry and Sergey had been showing at the board meeting, flying in people's houses and stuff, and the board finally said, Look, just stop playing with that, just buy the company and get on with the board meeting. <laughs> and uh, they bought our company right by the time they were going public, so that was really good for all the Keel employees. So basically 39 people created collectively what you know as Google Earth. It's now installed in, a homes, in homes of a billion people. And the idea of a <laughs> public purpose the idea of using one's secret information to provide, well, I, I think you, the word you use for it is truth. Right. Yeah, so, so the, the thing on, on that is there are a lot of maps, maps drawn by people that tell what the cartographer wanted you to know or believe. But there's a fundamental truth that the earth is what it is. You know, there's like, there's how you look without makeup. You know what I mean? There's like, there's, there, you know, there, there's, there's the real thing. And so the earth has a, has a realness to it. And it doesn't belong to people of one country or people of one faith. It's just all humans, all bonobos, all geckos, every, they all live on one planet, right? So it seems like that planet is something we kind of share, that we should share and treasure, that we should uh, consider our home and our only home. So we wanted to make sure that everybody could see it. So our goal was to get the, all the pictures of the earth that have ever been taken, mosaic them together, I could make a big quilt, so you could go anywhere you liked and see the best picture of that part of the Earth. So basically give the Earth back to its inhabitants. And that seemed fair to us. But it had some progenitors in terms of uh, cartography. Well, that's true. Uh, I have to admit that everything we did that's good, somebody else has done before. Um, but we did it our way. So before they, I, I, in fact, let me show you something. Okay, well, so, so before that, let's see if we can get the video or the screen to go here. So before that, there was this guy that I'm a real big fan of. His name is Martin Walzemuller. And if you've ever been to the Royal Museum, you've seen, or the Royal, Royal Academy in, in England, you've seen one of the originals of his map. He drew him the first map that was basically the entire world. So the universal part of his mapping was, it was all the known knowledge of cartography put together into one coordinated map. So he's got his like 12 pictures there. 
that's the quilting uh, that he did. You know, we did a few million pictures to make Google Earth, but it's the same idea. But more importantly, Waltz Mueller did something that was emotionally exciting to me as a child. So I've been a map kind of geek for a long time. And here's what he did. You probably can't see in this picture, look in the very bottom there, there's something wonderful. He figured that nobody in, you know, 1507 knew what an elephant looked like. You know, that is, he was in Europe, therefore everybody was in Europe in his mind. None of those people knew what an elephant looked like. And they didn't know where they came from. So he said, that's what they look like, and they kind of look like that, and that's where they come from, which, you know, they, the Okavango Delta area is popular with elephants, so that's a totally fine thing. And so, you know, so, so he, he actually thought that the world was not just where the land met the water, but it was what was there, at least when it came to elephants. And that seemed to me like a huge, a huge step in the right direction, because like, it, it's not the place, it's the meaning of the place. It's not, it's this kind of land or this kind of rock. It was like, nothing against geology if you're a geologist here, but it was like, this is where the elephants are. You know? And that, that's really a different story. It's a story of life. And so he was the first one to share life on a map. And place names were meant to represent where people lived, right. but they didn't tell us a lot about what people did or who they were. That's right. So, so there's another guy that's an uh, inspiration. And he was, uh, well, actually, let me, let me show you this. So this, this is uh, Google Earth, a screenshot. And it's, uh, you know, Southern Africa area. And uh, we make that from lots of pictures. These are pictures that have a large coverage but low resolution. More pictures that have a lower coverage but a higher resolution. You know, it's kind of like zooming in. But you still can't see elephants. So for that, we need airplanes. And as soon as you put a picture like this, into the story, then the place takes on a new meaning. It takes on a meaning that, that Waltz and Mueller knew, but it, it, it says, like, for example, you have the mother and father there and the babies in between. That's, that's about elephants being elephants. It's not about elephants being prisoners at the zoo. That's about elephants being elephants in the wild. And the idea of showing an entire planet that way was an inspiration to us. And like I said, we weren't the first to think of that. I always wonder what elephants would draw if they could draw the map. Would they draw the people? You know, that kind of thing. You know, are we important to them? So, the, the, it's a reasonable question. I talked about inversion earlier. That's the other way. What if the elephant drew the map? Would he put Chicago in there? Would he put Jackson Hole in there? You know, probably not. Right? I don't know. So I want to be really good, you know. He certainly would put Jane Goodall's house, right? So, um, <laughs> but my next inspiration is Elise Recluse. And, and Recluse had this, uh, he's a pretty strange guy, but he had this idea of a universal geography, and that's the closest thing to what we've done at Google and Google Earth and Google Maps, which is, it's not a map of the Earth, it's a map of the, the living truth of the Earth. You know, it's the land, it's the people, it's the animals, to the best we can do, it's, it's the, where the airplanes are, it's everything that we can get information about to make the Earth that we show you be a mirror, hopefully a good one, of reality make that available in 205 countries to more than a billion people a day. And when I saw this cover page, I wanted to know where all those people were from. Like, you know, where are they from? Are they from, is that what they look like in Texas? Is that what they look like in Wisconsin? You know, like, I don't know. Well, no, where are they from? So there's a natural question, because they're people. And so Recluse had this idea, here's one of his pictures. Those people are in Georgia. Well, you can tell that from their hats, you can tell them from the interesting kind of acts they use. So he thought that was an important part of making a map, a first-class part. I think that's true, too. So we, we did something at Google that's called Google Street View. And the idea of Street View is that we drive around taking pictures, and we don't aim the picture, we're not uh, artistic, but we capture enough information in the pictures <laughs> that you can see exuberance of children, you can see friendly soldiers, you can get a sense of commerce and activity. You know, I think there, there's some commerce going on. So the thing is, <laughs> You can understand the nature of human life, the meaning of places. It's not about, is it granite? It, it, it's, it's something very different than that. It's when they live there, they go to the barbecue restaurant in Lahore, Pakistan, they wear burqas. Well, that's, you know, not in Texas, not in North Carolina, but yes, in Pakistan, it's great. So this could be here almost, a little bit bigger river if the dam didn't break. Um, the, the concept here is that there's a, a truth to place that makes us all better people if we understand it. And our goal is always to share that truth as best we can. 
including things that are about animals. Just here we have the sable, the elusive sable. So we have our version of the elusive sable. It's called what's underwater. Most humans have only been on the dry part of the planet. So we worked with some people and have this thing that's a street view camera that goes underwater. And if you have that, then we can present something to everybody that has an internet browser or a mobile phone, a smartphone, as long as it's not a Blackberry phone, that, <laughs> that lets you go under the oceans and explore corals. We just launched something new from the Galapagos. It's, it's even more beautiful than this, hard to believe. That, that lets you go on a personal voyage through the ocean to understand what its lessons are. Not, not just to see a picture of a squid, but to see how far is the reef from the shore, how, how deep is, the, is this kind of animal from that kind of animal, can I see, you know, do I see, what do I see when I go in the reef, what does it look like down there, if I live down there, what would, what would my life be like? You know, I'm serious, I mean, like, that's the kind of thing I'm wondering about. What does it mean to be a fish? I, I mean, in, in a sense, what, what's, what daily life, you know, what do you do? Well, like here's a fish, I just recorded this off my screen. So here's a fish, you know, see the little black spot at the back there? That's the fake eye, so if you're gonna go eat him, you think, oh, he can see me, I'll never get close. <laughs> That's his fake eye. And there's this fish hanging out here in the hook-free zone. This little, uh, you know, like Starbucks there, the, 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 the other place you meet. Other fish, you know, hanging out down there. So it's like, these are things you don't know when you're on the shore. You don't know when you're, you know, in a hotel, driving out a car, flying an airplane. But this is, this is not in the middle of the ocean. This is just a few hundred yards offshore. And the thing is, most people, most of seven billion people, 6.99 billion of those people will never get closer than this. So I feel like we have an obligation to share the rest of the world with them. The same obligation that recluse felt. Yet using a universal map to make a personal map. Right, that's right. And using all of these resources to tell stories. And it's interesting because the thing that I think distinguishes humans, uh, much more than the opposable thumb, tools, we've, all that's been overtaken, we've learned that other animals do that. Humans tell stories. We tell stories going back to the days of the cave. And there is, it seems to me, a fundamental question to every story, which is, and then? That's right. And then, what happened next? And good storytellers structure stories. In journalism, I'm a very specialized storyteller. That's what I do. Stories have beginnings and middles and ends. And it is that understanding of narrative. And you can use these platforms, this technology, to tell new kinds of stories. That's right, absolutely. You know, we, we have a, let me give you an example of that. So, how many people have heard of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill? Okay, so if you, if you haven't, you shouldn't be in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, if you remember back to when it happened, you know, it's a big deal, very unfortunate, all kinds of truths about that. But look back when it, when it happened, there was in the news, because we have this mania now in the, in, in the Western news, to give numbers and to quantify things. So they would say, 371,000 barrels leaked today. Remember that? Every day it was like the barrel count. And how many of you know how big a leak is? It's got 317,000 barrels, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That, that is, that's, they were obsessed on these numbers, which I'm sure is very important numbers to oceanographers and so forth, but realistically, no one that hears that, that kind of a number can do anything useful. So one of our smartest people on the MAPS team had a new baby, and he had uh, dad duty to babysit the baby, to, to feed the baby and burp the baby, change the baby while his wife was asleep during the night. He spent a lot of time in the rocking chair. And so while he was there, he actually typed one-handed a program using Google Maps API that does this. It lets you type in a city, in this case, San Francisco, and that would be where the Deepwater Horizon oils, oil platform was. And it would draw and scale the oil blob as of that day, centered on your city. So if you live in San Francisco, you say, well, look, it goes down not all the way to Ocean, you know, down, down to Fort Ord, but it makes it down to Watsonville, Wat to, you know, past Watsonville. It makes it, you know, not out to Fresno, but almost. It makes it to Lake Tahoe. So you have a sense of that, I mean, if, if you're from there. If you were from Washington, D.C., for example, maybe you'd like to know that it makes it all the way, you know, to, to Philadelphia. 
It's never left Philadelphia. There you go. Well, I think it was there before the spill, to be honest. It was in Baltimore, too. Um, if you were on the big island of Hawaii, you're in Kona, well, you know, it makes it past all the macadamia nuts there in Hilo. <laughs> uh, it, if you were in, in London, it makes it all the way to Paris. It's sort of, I mean, to, 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 to across the channel. It's like the, uh, you know, D-Day. Uh, you know, if, if you're in Paris, it makes it up, up, you know, up across to other countries. If you're in Rome, it makes it to the Adriatic. Uh, worse for me since I'm a yacht guy. If you're in Monaco, it messes up the, the path to Portofino. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the point is that this is a story that nobody was prepared to understand. Because there's no experts in 300,000 300, barrels of oil. There's, there's, like, nobody can, but the dumbest, you know, anybody can understand a big blob on top of my house goes as far as over there. That, that's just, it's just natural to understand that. So sometimes you can use a map in a way that's not even cartographically responsible to make a story that every human understands with tremendous power. And I think that's a great thing when you can do that. You were talking earlier today in the session uh, before this about stories and power and how sometimes small stories are more powerful than comprehensive accounts that are documented carefully. That couldn't be, it couldn't be said better. Um, this is Afghanistan. But he'll try. <laughs> No, this is Afghanistan, and, and here's what I want to show you. Um, each of those markers represents a place where coalition soldiers were killed. In the Western tradition, you know, we might lose 5,000 of our soldiers. There's 400,000 of theirs that were killed. We don't talk about that. But every one of those represents one or more soldiers that were killed. The yellow ones are boys, and the blue ones are girls. If we fly over to Iraq, we see the same kind of thing and other places, training places, transport places, things happen. But as you fly further, you can see where each of those people grew up, where they lived, where their brothers and sisters are from, and their children. This is their homes. And if you come over to North America, what you see is a nation covered with corpses. Now, I've shown this to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I've shown it to the Secretary of State. I've shown it to a number of people of that ilk. And pretty much universally, they say, oh my god, I had no idea. Now, now it's not like they didn't know there was a war. I, I don't mean it. Like, it, wasn't, it wasn't that. It's that when you have an Excel spreadsheet that says 18 killed today, 4,207 so far, that's the human way of understanding that is very different than the human way of saying it's bodies from here to the horizon from sea to sea to, to shining sea. What I want is people to make informed decisions based on truth and facts, that they can use the best of their judgment based on the purity of data to lead to a better world. And we do everything we can to present data that way. And in fact, sometimes, and Rebecca especially, uh, Rebecca Moore cheats a little bit, and we, we kind of go beyond our Google perfect mirror thing to the Google sledgehammer thing. Um, and we make sure that the data is powerful, that connects with people in their soul, and it gives them the strength to act. And we talked to, to, to earlier today about, you know, I made this great movie, but nobody watched it, and they didn't stop shooting animals. Well, you know, it's never been better to tell stories than it is right now. Tools like Facebook, tools like Twitter, especially Twitter, I'll tell you why later. Tools like YouTube, tools like Google Earth, Google Maps, you know, whatever, whatever they are, is that everyone can use them. There's no, if you don't have a degree from the Film Institute, you can't use it yet. You can't touch it because you aren't old enough. There's none of that. If you have a story, you can tell it. If it wins in the, in, on meritocracy, it's the number one thing on YouTube, and a, a, 100 million people might see it like Sai doing his like goofy dance thing in Korea. You know, like, I don't know why that's popular. I really don't, to be honest. I don't know, I don't mind it. I just, I don't know, you know, but, but it, it worked for people, so they all watched it. That, that, that changes people's perspectives of how things work. I urge you to tell stories with all the power they deserve and to save what's left of natural, the natural world for future generations. And some would say there are, like any other map, political purposes to these maps that you're making and making possible uh, because 
there are borders, as there have always been, but uh, such things are in dispute, such things change. Uh, there are omissions, because certain powers decide that, urge you strongly, I, I, I think probably would be uh, a, a safe way to put it, not to put in certain areas or to blur them. We never blur data, never. That's, the newspaper thinks we do, we, we do not blur data. So what do you do when a government says, please don't show that nuclear facility, please don't show that prison camp? Well, the good news is that by international treaty, pictures taken from space are fair game. So by international treaty, it's okay to show whatever it is that you can see from space. Now, I admit that when they signed that treaty, they didn't think the cameras would be as good as they are now. <laughs> but, uh, but still, it's a or treaty. Or that they would go into private hands. It's a, it, both those things. So it's a, but it's a treaty, and that's the way it is. And my three friends and I are really glad that it worked out that way. So um, <laughs> we have an issue, though, now that we're Google, instead of just this little company, that we have employees in various countries, many countries, hundreds of countries, 100 countries. And so we have had cases where the local government has threatened us if we didn't fix the map from its current 100% of the truth configuration to some locally more pure, politically correct version. And so far, we're 100% successful in being politically unreliable. You know, we, we, but, but, but some of these governments are very strong and they threaten heinous things to our people. So we can't, you know, as, as a manager, executive, you can't like let bad things happen. So what we do is first we show borders. We ask every country what their border is. And if they don't match, if they match, we draw it in yellow. If we don't match, we draw it in red. So if it's, you have a red border somewhere, that means Wisconsin and Canada are at war with each other, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not hey, like our- 54, 40 or fight. Uh, there you go. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not our problem. I mean, it's, you're the ones who don't agree, you know? Like, it's, it, you work it out, you know? And um, no, I mean, that, that, that's the truth of it. That's like the dictionary saying what all the definitions are, not just the number one definition, right? So then we try to label that, like this is what Pakistan thinks is part of Pakistan as opposed to what India thinks. And we show the other one, this is what India thinks instead of Pakistan. And the other one is what China thinks. And What's interesting about that is that seems to me like a brilliant answer. I was proud of that answer. I go around the world explaining that to governments that are mad. It's a journalistic answer. It, it, it's, it's a comprehensive, honest, truthful answer. You know, how could that be assaulted? Um, it turns out it's easily assaulted by mean governments <laughs> uh, because it's not, not the answer they want. And so um, the only thing that had a problem with that is in the People's Republic of China where it's illegal. It's, a, it's illegal in India to draw a border that's not their border, but it's only a misdemeanor. But in China, it's a felony. And felonies have their own, you know, have a discouraging factor. Talk about hammers, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what we, what we do is if you look at, if you, there's a Google, like maps.google.com and maps.google.co.jp for Japan and .co.uk for Yank. If you go to the .cn homepage map, it's a map that doesn't show any borders for China. It doesn't show any borders for any neighbor. So basically China is like just, there it is, and all, all the countries around it are sort of like labeled but undefined. And that's what they get. You know, they, 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 they play with the truth and they lost it. We're not going to lie for them, but we're also not going to, like, you know, take them off the map and say, so there. I mean, it's uh, uh, 1.3 billion people want to know where, how to go from place to place, you know, so we're trying to serve the people, but, but we don't lie to help governments lie to their people. There was a blank spot. And, and you shouldn't either. You know what I mean? If, if your conservation story is unpopular in Abusistan, then, then, then you deserve to be unpopular there. You know what I mean? It's okay. You know, you're not known by your friends. You're known by your enemies, okay? People who hate you for what you stand for, you should consider your ways. And if you're proud of that, you should be extra proud. You know, it just convicts them. It's okay. You're, you're not popular in North Korea. Actually, Eric just went there a few months ago. My boss, Eric Schmidt, he went over there and uh, visited with them. They were real nice. Uh, uh, but it was an interesting place, you know, they took him to the high technology center and showed him their computer center. And here's the thing, it's like, it's really important to understand, every country's this way. It's a couple of leaders and a bunch of citizens, you know what I mean? It's like, there's the queen with her thumb and everybody else is a subject, you know what I mean? It's, that's the way it is. They're in this building, they're showing off to us, their high technology is 30 degrees in that building. You know, it's their computer center, well, it's, they don't have heating problems, right? But they, 
They don't have air conditioning at all, heating at all. So everybody's wearing these parkas. You can see their breath. They're trying to type at a computer with big gloves on. That's, that's where North Korea is. And every citizen that's there is a victim of that. The fact that there are 20 people that are, make it that way, I mean, I don't blame the citizens of that. That's, I'm sorry for it. Hmm. The um, objections, some of them, are not that you show too little, but that you show too much. That the sense of privacy, the sense of wildness, the sense of wilderness has been lost by the fact that we can now visit a virtual copy of almost any place on Earth. I suppose so. But I uh, don't apologize for that. You were blind before, and now you can see. Now you can see a little bit too much. I mean, wouldn't you want Superman's x-ray vision, even if like, people wonder what you were looking at? You know what I mean? So like, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's phenomenally empowering that humans understand their planet. It's phenomenal. We, we even changed, we made the, the, the user metaphor when you use Google Earth, where it's like you're holding a ball and turning it. Because it's like, it's like a God's eye view where you're God and you're looking at your planet. It's your planet, each person. So like, I think that's almost sacred to me, almost sacred. You can zoom in on the beaches of Africa and see seals play. That is fantastic. You can see all the National Geographic stories at the place the picture was taken. I think that's fantastic. You can see so many things. You can see you know, activist type things like coal, large scale coal things with mountaintop removal. You can see, you can see the important issues of life made understandable so that people can make an informed decision. And I think any time you inform people without trying to force their hand, you've done everybody a service. Tell us about the distinction between Google Earth and Google Maps. Uh, well, here's the deal on that. So in Maps, well, from a user point of view, uh, we keep track of how often, how, how often people use things, how they use it. In Google Earth, when people visit, it's a billion people on average is monthly, on average, they use it for about 18 minutes. Google Maps, a billion people, different people, almost daily, they use it for like a minute, 45 seconds to a minute. And the reason for that is, I mean, they may use it many times in a day, but they don't like go to Maps and just drive around for hours. You know what I mean? They, have a, they want to know something. How do I get to the, where's the bathroom? You know, they want to know something. Hey, some of us can get lost on Google Maps. And, and they, they type in where they want to go, they see where they go, and they go there. No, they, they, it's a quick thing. Where is it? It's over there. Okay, and they go. Google Maps, that's Google Maps. It, it's, uh, it's like the dictionary, you know, it's like, I want the answer, and I move on. Google Earth is more like the encyclopedia. It's like, I want to know the, the whole story about the Gombe Preserve. I want to see, for example, you can turn on the Jane Goodall layer, you can see a mark for every tree where there's a, a, a chimp that the the students there track, and you zoom in on that, you can click, you can see their chimp's picture and the daily blog of what they're doing that day. Okay, so like, but it's in that particular tree. It's, it's, it's accurate. And so that, that isn't a 30-second 30, 30 thing. That's like watching a nature show. Maybe that's the problem. They're not watching your movie, they're all watching Google Earth. I don't know, I don't know, I'm just saying, you know. But, but, um, but the thing is, it, it's an experiential thing. They want to go, they want to be at Gombe. They don't want to find the Hilton. They, they want to be in Gombe. And to me, those are incredibly different. Maybe I'm just, you know, a proud father. But I mean, I, I think that's a huge difference in the psychology of what these things mean. Where does it stop, though? Because you will, can have all these mosaics, including pictures that each of us take on our cell phones. Our cell phones know where all of us are. Um, you told me you can tell the speed of the traffic in Kandahar. Yeah, yeah we, we do that. So. Uh, so let's talk about that. This is kind of like the, the go from the, the comfortable, exciting part to the science fiction scary part. So, so here, here's, the, here's the deal. If you ever use, you've used Google Maps? Okay. If you, if you, if you turn on the, there's a, you can layers of data, and one of the things you can see is uh, traffic. And then it'll color code the roads. Instead of being just a line, it'll be a green line if it's full speed. And um, I don't, you probably won't have this here in Montana, but they have, if you have like more than one or two cars on a road, Wyoming. they, 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 <laughs> They go slower, you know? And so in California, we call that traffic, you know? And uh, it, so when that happens, we draw, we draw the road in it like in red or yellow. It was kind of like light traffic and red, which means kind of like walking is better than driving, okay? And that's really good because there's multiple ways to go places, at least in s states that have a lot of roads. And so 
what you can do is you can say, I'll go on the green way instead of the red way because I get home sooner. And so it's a natural thing. So how do we get that data? Well, we get that data because one, more than one billion people have Android phones in their purse, in their pocket, on their desk. And every few minutes it says, I've been going about 27 miles an hour lately. Well, it doesn't say who it is, doesn't say anything, but it, it tells it tattles. And we aggregate all that back up and say, on that, on that road, the average speed in the last 15 minutes has been 19.1 miles an hour. So that's, that's definitely, probably, that's red in Montana and it's green in California, but still, <laughs> um, we color code that so you know what's going on. And because those billion people are all around the world, we know the traffic in tiny Polynesian islands, and we know the traffic in Kandahar and Abbottabad. I know the traffic speed in Abbottabad, past Osama's last house. You know what I mean? It's, it's incredible you can know that. And so you might say, it's incredibly great. Or you might say, that's a little bit incredibly creepy. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. I'm not trying to tell you how it is. But the technology that exists now lets every human become a sensor to measure all kinds of things. To measure ozone levels, to measure you know, pollen counts. I mean, with a phone that had more goodies inside it. Pollen counts could tech for uh, ricin or various kinds of poisons. Somebody had to sneak onto the subway in Great Britain, all the phones go off. You know, that'd be actually pretty handy, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty good. I mean, maybe that's a worth, good thing if your phone is like the, the protecting thing, you know? So the role of phones, amount of data being gathered, scary, it's exciting, it's both those things. And there are commercial applications in this. There are, and one of my favorite, you know, this is, I can't invest in this company because I work at Google, but if I could, this is my favorite one, okay? I'll just tell you this. So, this is a company called Field Agent. This is so awesome. Prepare to be horrified, okay? <laughs> now, okay, these, these guys are great. So the Field Agent, the guys that are in Bentonville, Arkansas, they used to work for a big retailer based there. Um, <laughs> but they quit. They started this company. And here's how it works. Like, if you're, uh, say, Procter & Gamble, and you want to know if Pampers are stocked at the local grocery store, because maybe, you know, they're slack. They only put the other brand up there. That's why your sales are down. So you want to know how many... Boxes of Pampers are on the shelf. How many cans of Coke? Whatever. How are you going to drive all over the country looking for little stores to count that? That's inconceivable. So here's what these guys do. This is so awesome. You're going to never be sleep well again. <laughs> There's this application that you can buy or download for free for your iPhone or Android phone, either one. It's called Field Agent. And when you download it, you become a field agent. And you put in your PayPal number so it can make deposits for you. You, you, you deposit only, and then you just turn it off and you carry your phone around like business as usual. Then next week, when Parton Gamble wants to know about Pampers at the Safeway that you're in, your phone shakes, because they know your location. And it says, if you'll go take a picture of the Pampers, I'll give you $3. <laughs> you take the picture, and it's uploaded automatically to them, and they deposit $3 for you. And they have hundreds of thousands of people around the world doing this. Okay. We have somebody in the front row taking a Depend stock right now. <laughs> exactly. So, 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 I, so, you know, I was so captivated. I'm a futurist. I'm supposed to figure this out for Google. I didn't think of this. So I, so I said, I said uh, like, what do they want to know? You know, I go, what questions are common? They said, all kinds of questions. No, no. I want to know what questions are common. What's, what's the most interesting question? They said, well, there's a lot of people say, if you'll take a picture of all the white, the license plates of all the white cars at the motel parking lot, I'll pay you $10 a picture. That would be handy in divorce cases, right? Okay? So, so you tell the field agent, take all the white cars, because you know Mr. X is driving a white car, and then when the pictures come back to you, the, the, the purchaser of this intelligence, you can look for the license plate of the person you're trying to track, and you know, you pay $50, and you, you know the guys at this hotel somewhere in Montana. That seems to me like an interesting world, and just so you know, They've been doing this for two and a half years, okay? This isn't a maybe thing, okay? So, so it's an interesting concept. So when you see a phone and it knows location, it can send pictures. People can type in numbers like 47 cans of beer on the wall or whatever. Then they, you should say, well, how could all that be put together for some purpose? Now, this is the kind of creepy, weird thing, but, but imagine it was the other way. It could be Jane Goodall's field people looking for how many chimps they saw. It could be people looking for how many trees were cut down. And, and if you wanted to find out something like that, you could It could find be out. the annual bird count. It could be any, you know, and, and so it's, it's I, th I think it's both horrible and fantastic at the same time. Um, from Google's point of view, we couldn't touch that. You know, that was like, 
is too creepy. But, uh, <laughs> but if you like it, feel free to give them a call. And maybe you could do some field work that way. You know, I don't know. This is not a story application, but there are story applications throughout. You were telling us how, for example, the graphic of the, uh, of the oil leak from the, from the Gulf superimposed gave people a, an idea of the extent of the damage. Uh, not a perfect idea, but there are no perfect ideas. Graphics are intrinsically limited. Nevertheless, they tell powerful stories. Another way to tell stories is through games. Games are highly structured stories. And this technology allows us to, well, your work, you've, you've, you're just about to debut a new game. Right, so, so uh, I've had the good fortune of being involved in two independent products that have scaled to touch more than a billion people's lives. Only one of which people at Google know about, but anyway, two, two products. <laughs> and um, I'm working on the third one. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about my pet project that I'm working on with some friends. And basically everybody but one that worked on Keyhole, as a matter of fact. Um, we, had a, we had a thought process, and this is strange, I think strangely, so be prepared for strange comments. We had a thought, well, if Google Maps is the dictionary, and Google Earth is the encyclopedia, then what about all the other kinds of literature? What's, what's the Harlequin romance novel? What's Sports Illustrated? What's, what's the New York Times? You know, it, that is, what other kinds of literature that could be based on geography could there be? So we already did the dictionary and the encyclopedia, and I, we you know, did okay on that. What, what other kinds of literature could there be? And we thought, you know, entertaining, fun, engaging, emotional, storytelling, using maps. And since I wanted, since I, I, I kind of browbeat people earlier today about effective storytelling, I thought it was only fair to give you a chance to browbeat me by showing you, I want to show you how we're trying to tell a story using, using, using mapping data as, as our metaphor, even though it's not about maps. And it's not in your space, but maybe you can make the big leap from a powerful story, hopefully, told using a map about places that engages people to your need to tell powerful stories that involve a map that engage people. It's working for us, and maybe it could work for you. Okay, so could we uh, turn the lights down up here? Okay, so this is gonna be strange, but just, just relax. Open, open your mind and say, I'm just gonna watch this and I'm gonna think, well, this is what a map is? Okay. So the narrative is that for a long time, a new kind of energy has been leaking into our world, even back in Civil War days. And you see some exotic matter leaking into the, into the, into the, into the air there. And it, if that man stands that close to it, even though he can't see it, it's invisible, but this special picture, I guess, it might affect his judgment. And so, so he, here, here's kind of the, 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 the first hint of how this works. Well, that's, 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 that's a bad experience because it's playing on my computer over there, and I don't like that. You could hold the microphone next to the speaker. That is brilliant. Let me do that, and you stay here. You should work at Google. Okay. Okay. Wait, where's the speaker? Okay. There's more to the world than you can truly see. Oh, come on. You, you ready? You sensed it. Come on. But you cannot tell. You're cheating. You ready? There's more to the world than you can truly see. You've sensed it, but you cannot tell. Game? Something is very wrong. No, that's not working, is it? Strange occurrences. Visions affecting us. Are we being watched? I'm a truth seeker with many questions. This was a teaser. That, that was not good. So can you get more volume somehow? What's going on over there? We're doing you, our you best. You got it? Okay. Oh, okay. I can bring my microphone over there. So, so we, uh, we had this teaser going for a while. This is just kind of a quiet beta. And the idea was there's a website you could go to. And you, every day, this is way into the website, but the first day, that's day 30, 
or whatever. The first day, there was just one thing up there. You could click on that, it would expand. It would be a memo, but if you download the memo and you process it in Photoshop, you could read in secret writing in it. It was like a mystery. And every day, there's another piece of this mystery. After a month of mean teasing, we actually launched the real introduction to the game. And I'm going to show that to you now. I'm going to take my microphone over there. What was the net effect of the Niantic project? We had crossed a threshold in which global security could be at risk. Decrypting the data was the mistake. This is not psychosis or some cognitive break, but an actual takeover of the mind. Much of the public sculpture found in our cities is based on design seeded in the human mind. Certain places have an energy that not only attracts people, but attracts events. The mission of 13 Magnus is to monitor the effects of mind hacking. Obviously, this will be done with the highest of security, to make sure that the ideas do not contaminate or threaten humanity. This all leads to Niantic. I know that many tools will be needed to fight this battle. You just have to know where to look and know what you're seeing. Portals emit exotic matter into our world, and that matter has certain effects on our world. I started noticing that there were energy fields, anomalies on Earth all around me. A few of them exhibit properties that are as yet unexplained. I know that there are others out there. What if they're already among us, but we don't realize it? And I must be prepared to work with them or fight them. They are coming. Something's wrong out there in the world. This doesn't feel like a scientific study. The one hope lies in understanding what happened to Niantic. Not all mysteries are solvable, but the joy comes in the pursuit. So people had this lust, like, what, what is it? What, what's going on here? And the, here's, the, here's the sort of short story of it. There's this force that it in, kind of invades our planet. Uh, it has to do with CERN and other things. It affects people, and it changes their abilities, smarter, brighter, more creative. It might control their mind a little bit, which is kind of like becoming a puppet. You don't know. We don't tell you, and you don't know yet. Um, so you have a choice. You can join the resistance team, which engages to prevent this from happening, like the humanists that want to keep people not affected by for unknown alien powers, or the enlightened team, which enjoys being smarter and more creative, but doesn't really care who's pulling the puppet strings. Um, and so far, we've had about 50-50 people taking the two, you can just decide when you sign up. You go around, the, you, go around you to gather energy. It's like Pac-Man, in a sense, but you have to go and get the power dots. So you can't sit at your desk and play it. You don't play it. You play with a phone. You go to places. Only way you can play it. So you need to get power. So you've got to walk all around to get power. You can see it on your little screen. It's kind of like a tricorder. So it tells you where to go. You can see things in the real world that other people can't see. And you get energy. When you get enough energy, you go to one of these portals. And it just so happens that we spent a year and a half getting, um, almost two years actually, getting a map of all the public art objects in the world. So every sculpture, every gargoyle, every, every fountain. So it turns out that that's where the energy is. So we force you, so to speak, to go to all the art objects and stand there and look at them for a while. Okay? <laughs> okay that's, that's, our, you know, that's our sneaky, uh, you know, subterfuge there. But anyway, when you're there, you do some stuff and you can take over the portal, that art object. And if you get two portals, you get, there's a line that is drawn between the portals. You get three portals, you get a triangle. And it's like you've taken over that, that zone, like capture the flag. Except that zone is potentially spans the entire planet and all the art objects in the whole planet. There's a lot of story, a lot more details, but that's the idea. You can only play by going and doing. No sitting at your desk, no like sitting in front of the TV set. You have to hike all around and do things. Now, because of that though, when you get to places and you use your computer, your, your phone, you can see things other people can't see. So you're playing a game in public with kind of private data and all the other players see the same data but all the losers that are just regular people that aren't playing the game, <laughs> they don't see anything. They have no idea what's going on. So it's kind of like a joke about that. It's kind of fun. You're playing a game, they don't even know what's going on, and you're having a great time. So, so that's the uh, kind of the start of it. There's another thing to it, which is in the game, you have you know, one of these two teams, the blue and the green. At the bottom there, you see it says, come. Hit that button, and you're in a walkie-talkie mode with other people on your team. You can pick the radius. You can talk to strangers. You can meet to do things together and do joint projects. We have... I can't give the number, but we have half a million, more than half a million people 
wandering around doing this around the world 24 hours a day now in our limited closed beta. Okay, let's uh, turn the lights down again. These are some pictures from users. They've gathered together in the snow, they've gathered together in parks, they didn't know each other before, they met through the game. Now, listen to this. Oh, no, you can't listen to this. You can't listen to this because you don't have audio. So let's, I'm going to go back over here. <laughs> what? Try it again. Hello? Ah, we, we've gone. Good. I'm not. We've retrogressed. We've gone from lavaliers to wireless, and now wired microphones. And I, I have to ask why you use attractive young women as your correspondents instead of golden throated radio announcers. For the same reason that uh, people grouse that viewers don't enjoy their wildlife videos. <laughs> um, for the same reason that National Geographic had a swimsuit issue. Um, so this, this video is done every single week. That's an early one. Every single week there's a new one. All the things in there are real. Those aren't pretend. Those are like video. I mean, the story is not exactly real. But I mean, the, the, the people all around the world, every week it's in different continents. People linking up continents. On Veterans Day, more than 220 people made a link, two links all the way across the United States, going only through military bases and military cemeteries. See, they express their, their life through their game, play of the game. Okay, so it's, 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 more, it's, it's a game. You might say a lightweight, silly game. But it, it's a game that lets them be active, meet people, do things, get instant accomplishment, has immediate weekly feedback, that every accomplishment they make makes them a global celebrity. These YouTube videos, if you go to YouTube and look for Ingress, you'll see millions of views. So to many people who are 18 or 12 or 25, who are lonely or who like getting out and doing things, it's better than watching TV. See what I'm saying? It's engaging. I mean, it, is, it has proven to be engaging. So this is... This is like, I said, what is a map when it's not a dictionary, an encyclopedia? It's a sort of science fiction game played on top of places. Hmm. We're going to uh, take questions from the audience, uh, if you've got any, about uh, the uses of this technology and how it, it's possible to tell stories and how it may relate to what you're doing. I, I very much enjoyed your talk. You're very engaging. And I, I really appreciate the time that you take to come to something like this. Um, I also appreciate your. The, your message of telling stories with maps and the, the resonance of, of telling stories. So, okay, I'm, I'm a gorilla biologist, I'm a scientist, and I definitely value data, but I'm also slowly learning the importance of telling stories. And the, the same way Jane Goodall talks about David Grade Beer, I, I could talk about Ruchina, I could talk about Matu, I could talk about Thursday. Um, but at the same time, um, I could also tell you a story where in the village next to where I've worked for the last 15 years, there's a school with 400 children that share two long drop outhouses. Um, they, very, few of the kids have, have, have shoes, let alone books, where it would literally cost $30 per child <laughs> to provide books for these children. And I watch this, and also I, I read an article in the New Yorker recently that was discussing the, the, the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, and the disparity between the economic situation and, and what tech people, the social responsibility that tech people are or aren't taking in the political realm. And so expanding that globally, and also in the context of this workshop with ape conservation, if you could address the issue, the gap is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, this technology is absolutely amazing, but <laughs> You know, reading is one of the most precious things in lives. We literally, in life, and we literally have billions of people out there that can't even read. And we're, we're losing apes out there all the time. And, and so if you could address how, as, as working for a, an extremely powerful, wealthy corporation, we could work together as private industry, governments, NGOs, or whatever, how we can bridge that gap and, and live as a, a global society and protect apes and you as a business can succeed. Thank you. That's an omnibus question. I think any way I answer it, well, I'll miss part of it. But I can't talk about all the things we do at Google because it's not time to talk about them. But we work, we have a multi-billion dollar foundation called google.org that does a lot of the things you describe. We have a big project in Google Research to do uh, edu, you know, educational outreach. And we have uh, built course building software. We're working with universities. We're working with non-university, like life learning type situations to build 
entire curricula that can fit into a tablet. That you have like, you know, MIT in a, in a, in a, in a tablet and a solar power charger. Um, we, we have you know, a lot of things to try to help this problem. If it was just buying everybody an Android tablet or an iPhone or what, what, what if it was buying some gadget, that'd be no problem at all. You know, I work with Lorreen Jobs, Lorreen Powell Jobs, the Steve, Steve Jobs' widow, um, on efforts to try to educate people. Carlos Salim works with us. We had dinner the other night. It's like they have the world's richest man, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, very wealthy, one of the wealthiest women in the United States. Uh, Google, I'm representing Google. A lot of interest, you know, $180 billion represented at that table, okay, in the, in the six, five families that were there, okay? Mm -hmm. The five families. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but with, the, with the, what you could buy, like the cost of a tablet, you could provide school books for, uh, you know, like 50 kids. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I have a 8,000 volume library at home. I have no, no problem with books, okay? I have no problem with that. Most countries in the world are not waiting to have Google show up and teach their children what to believe, you know what I'm saying? So working the education process is is like working the, helping the country have what it wants, what it wants to educate its people its way. And in some countries, that needed money, in some countries that's fine. I work at the State Department, USAID. If it's just money, that's one thing. It's almost never just money. Change chimps don't just need money. You know what I mean? They need a mental change of, of the people in the neighborhood to have a, a mindset that makes things work. And a lot of these countries, we need to have a mindset to make things work. I will tell you this though, I am, completely, in fact, maybe maniacally among the people that get a vote on this, totally about education, totally, personally. And I had a kind of strange childhood, very unusual childhood, won't go into it, but I really believe in uh, self-education, yeah. autodidactic abilities, and the unlimited ability of people to make themselves what they want to be by just having information. That's why I stayed at Google when we sold our company. I, I'm convinced that we can make a huge impact. We're doing things uh, do a Google search or a Microsoft search, if you probably can find it, called Project Loon, L-O-O-N. You will discover we're looking at putting up many balloons floating around the stratosphere to deliver high-speed internet access to people all around the world. Okay, Whatever you think the internet has done in the last 15 years in your lives, whether it's email or Facebook, everything in between, Google Maps, Google Earth, hopefully it's on your list, one-third of humans are enjoying that. The other two-thirds don't know what that is. So when you're sitting comfortable about how great that is, I don't think you should be, don't think it's great. I don't think you should like be sad because somebody's sad somewhere. That seems kind of, you know, that's kind of extreme. But I think you should know that if it's so great for you, you should want it for them. It's your moral obligation. So we're all about that. And you find a lot of companies really, like Coca-Cola Coca is super big on clean water for people. But it's to make if they have a book if they're gonna die from bad water. You know, there's, you know, there's a whole series of issues that a lot of these countries have grotesque problems that involve national corruption, uh, failed infrastructure, you know, the, the many things. So like to get them to study calculus, they need to like not get shot going to school. You know, I mean, there's like so many things. And so it, it's, it would be presumptuous for companies or rich people to just say, well, I'll just send them some books. I mean, I mean I'm serious, but there's no lack of will. I've never seen lack of will anywhere. I've seen, never seen it in the state. I've never seen it from the president. I've never seen it from like Google executives or, or you know anybody else executives, people, uh, you know for the most part, they get it that we live a charmed life. In the case of our case, privileged to be born in America where things are just fantastic, privileged to be born in a nice part of the country where things work well, you know, privileged not to be abused based on race or color. You know, we, we're we're proud and, and lucky and grateful and give back. So it's not. I don't think there's like a problem with that. It's just it's not all about us, you know. And so it's a big part of helping people. I gave a kind of a snide comment earlier today about helping people help themselves in a way, you know, local people do what they want to do, not what you want them to do. And that's something we, I think we should obey too. How do they want to train their people? How, what do they want to do? And so if in a lot of places, the only school book is the, is the Quran, should you buy them more Quran? Should you not send them the Quran? Should you send them one of each? You know what I'm saying? Like th there's some cultural issues that aren't solved by just money or doing things. And so we, we work hard at that and, and I think uh, Twitter's working hard at that. I, I've seen a lot of companies really display quite a bit of uh, mature statesmanship in about that. I did an interview once, or an article in uh, the Columbia Journal of, of, of International Affairs, which is like the boring magazine for ambassadors, about, you know, what, what's a Google world like? And one of the things we talked about was global access to information will transform people that have no information, a lot more people have 
a lot of information. If you have an air conditioner, you get a better air conditioner, their quality of life goes up only slightly, less noisy or something. But if you have no air conditioner, you have got an air conditioner, even if it's a terrible one, your life is great, you know, in, in that sense. So the peop less people have, the more, even a little bit better, is great for them. I don't want them to have everything, but you know, we, we owe it to those people, and I think, I think a lot of, I'm, I'm, I've seen a lot of companies take it very seriously. I, my job is to go around the world and talk to presidents. I see a lot of governments want to work with companies. You know, we work with Indonesia, we work with Iceland. We, we do a lot of really good things, and I think we're not unique in that. I think it's pretty common, actually, to, to, do, to do good things. I see it's very common, so take heart in that. Great, thank you. Uh, quick, uh, two quick, um, uh, a story and a question. Uh, maybe it's about conservation, maybe it's not. Uh, it's mainly a way to say thank you. You talked about stories. Uh, it's hard not to be reminded of uh, Isak Dinesen's line that all stories can be, all sorrows in life can be born if one can tell a story mm -hmm. or tell a story about them. How sad that that was actually a lady named Karen von Blixen who had to write under a, a male's name to get published. But uh, quick story on how Google Earth and Google um, uh, maps intersected with our life. My brother is a uh, Vietnam veteran, uh, disabled, hearing disabled and, and physically disabled, uh, that I was able to find a house for in Anderson, Indiana, the town he grew up in when his wife died. Uh, and, and we were able to zoom down and look and see that in fact it had a yard and he has a dog that is able to tell him when someone is coming to the door because he's so hearing disabled he can't hear it. Um, so that ability to change people's lives is, is deeply meaningful and, and that very much appreciate it. I, I think that when it comes down to those individual pieces, that's a form of conservation, conservation of a person's ability to have a life they wouldn't have had without that technology. I couldn't help but think though, when I saw the correspondence, for lack of a better term, uh, to wonder why they weren't on the streets of Chicago to say, you know, how can we prevent the violence that's occurring? How, can't w how can we not zoom down to see what's happening there and keep young black men and three-year-old children from getting shot in the face by what's occurring there? So first of all, thank you for your kind words. There are three or four of us here from Google and I think we all appreciate that on behalf of a large team. Thank you for your kindness there. Um, you know, there actually is a lot of information about crime and uh, most cities now have a the crime blotter where the police put out a list of crimes and they'll put the location and there are a number of websites that if you do Google search for like, you know, crime map, Peoria, you know, that kind of thing, you'll find that and it, it shows you a map and it shows you, you can pick violent crimes, petty, you know, petty crimes, uh, major heinous felonies, you know, there's the categories and it'll show you the places, give the details. So that's happening. I've done that. A, this is so-called so hotspot policing and it has been shown to be effective uh, in reducing crime rates across the United States, it's been responsible, police believe, for the reduced crime that we've seen over the past 20 years. Uh, there are other factors as well, but they can map these things. It doesn't merely push them around to different areas, it reduces it. Right, and I, I'll, I'll give you a, an example of that that I think is pretty shocking. Uh, registered sex offenders, you know, sex offenders, one of the things in the United States, you have to register when you move or whatever. And there's some rules about being a sex offender. Uh, well, like if you're an ex-felon, you've got to give your location to the parole board or whatever. But if you're a sex offender, you've got to register every time you move. And you aren't supposed to live, in general, near um, places where children congregate, you know, elementary schools, playgrounds, that kind of thing. So I got downloaded the, uh, the D.C. area, you know, Prince William County, uh, you know, all, all around there, all around D.C. Downloaded all the sex offender database, and I made a map of that. I was going to be like a congressman. And basically, I, I could zoom in to the street level, and you could see that basically half of the sex offenders lived around public parks and, and elementary schools. And it makes sense to me because it's like the watering hole in, in, in Africa. You know, if you were a lion, you'd hang out near the watering hole because they all got to come drink and you eat them. So it's, it's reasonable that sex offenders would want, you know, child sex offenders would want to hang out near children that are unsupervised. It's against public policy. And if you look at it on a map, you instantly know. So I use that to lambast all of the, like the FBI and you know, all these people saying, look, somebody registers, what do you do, just type it in and then go home? Why don't you like, look on a map and see if it's where they're supposed to be? You know, like, wh what's the point of asking just to be asking? And the guy said, well, my job is to like, write down the address. You know, I'm saying, look, you know, why don't you, you know, you know, you know, 
You must do this. I mean, you must. You can use any map you like, but, you know, MapQuest, I don't care about that, but you need to look where the people are to see if it's okay. And so those things do happen, and it has made a difference in almost every city in the United States now. They plot those things on, on some map, and uh, they make that decision when people register. And they make a move, they, they, they you know, slap them around with rubber hose, whatever they do, they do something to make them move out of that spot, you know, that day. You know, you, you can't stay there. And so I think that's actually fantastic. And that's the kind of thing where lack of awareness leads to, uh, say, a kind of semi-informed confidence. And real, inform real information lets people make a, a rational, informed decision, which may be a much better decision in the lives of many people. At the same time, it has to be acknowledged, of course, it's not a panacea that these yeah. terrible things are going to continue to happen. Thanks very much. Um, my name's Damien Mander. I'm with the International Anti-Poaching Foundation. I, I seem to find that most of my spare time these days is taken up with answering emails, and I, I don't know if I'm more constructive now than what I would have been 15 years ago if I didn't have all these emails. Anyway, I answer them, and I'm sure everyone else in the room is the same, and we're trying to figure out if we're keeping on top of things or, or, or in front. What I want to know is the technology you just showed us here. I mean, I don't have time to go and gather around an art piece or a fountain. What I wanted to know is how can you use that technology to save animals in the vast remoteness of Africa? Well, that's a good question. So what, what I would hope is that when you... The reason I showed that is that people were talking about these films that make great film, and there's no engagement afterwards. And I was trying to say, look, if you, if you design for engagement, if you give constant feedback, let people talk to each other, the weekly update, if you celebrate people's successes, these are, these are all things that Jane Goodall would do, for example, just in different ways. The fact is, the computer isn't the point. The point is that people need to be stroked a little bit, people need to be informed, they need to be motivated, you know, they need to be part of an event. You know, these, are, these are things you do to get people engaged in things. Part of something greater than themselves. It's necessary. It's like a cathedral building. If when you're part of a project bigger than yourself, you have like superpowers. And these are ways that I've seen work. People get married, they meet each other this way. I mean, things really make a difference in people's lives. And I would love to see this kind of thinking applied to protection of nature. And in fact, we have simple ways of doing this that we teach people in courses all around the country. In fact, tomorrow, one of the, one of the courses tomorrow is how to use these kinds of things to teach, to teach people how to use it in conservation tasks. So there's a Google group talking about that. You might want to talk to them. You can learn a lot from that. They'll even show off something that's not widely known, that's brand new, that might help you make a big difference in your, in your job. Okay, I, I spoke today, and, and one of the things I, I brought up was that the technology and the systems for us to swing the tide in this war, this war against losing all the animals and losing all the environment that we're losing around the world, it exists, and it's sitting in military hangars around the world, and it's been succeeded by technology that we're still trying to recreate decades after it's already been used by the military. You guys have a think tank. You have a lot of money. How can we use what you guys have to help us win this war? Okay, so we're not as smart as you think, probably, okay? I we doubt try, that very much. We try that really hard. We try really hard, but I mean, we're just people, you know? Um, but the, so I really can't answer that for Google, but I can say for myself that if you want to change people's behavior on a large scale, you need to have people know why they're would want to change their behavior. In my mind, treat them like volunteers. You need to create a, a, a story or a narrative that makes people want to join your religion. You don't need a gun to make them join your religion. They're not really as pious as you hope if you do that. So you need, a, like, like they're talking about making it economically more viable to protect the land rather than destroy it. That's a great plan. Making it a prison sentence to destroy the land while the children starve no, is a no, no go. Everybody would be willing to die to protect their children. So, so you have to have a, a winner for the people who you see as the problem. That's thing number one. You have governments in some cases where things just aren't going to work because that government's going to not let them work. You know, you can send them aid. They'll steal the stuff and sell it to get the money for the king to buy a new Rolls Royce. Or, you know, they're, they're, that, that kind of thing happens. And when, where that happens, foreigners just tossing money or whatever, it, it's, it's, it's not going to work. So, so, so and, and invading isn't really going to work. And so there, there's some things that are just actually really, really hard. Okay, they're really hard. You're right. The, the people are the power. Yeah, I, I believe that. Now, and, people have, and the information is the religion, and you guys are the Bible. You guys can deliver that. And, and we, we need, do that. We need we you do to that. help us deliver that information. I, 
there are two things we can do. We can make tools and platforms that make it easy for you to express your story to the billions of people of the world, and we've done that, I think, really well, you know, in terms of Maps and Earth and YouTube, and all these kinds of things, Gmail, whatever. You can, you can communicate your story. If we can't do it for you, uh, Twitter and Facebook will help you do it. I mean, th there's, there's a constellation of tools wherever the internet goes that make communication transform from all human experience. So if you can't get the word out now, you, you're, I mean, it's, you're the problem, not, 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 not communication. However, getting people to change has been hard. You know, it was hard in the Garden of Eden, and it's still hard. You know what I mean? So it's hard. So, so the, the process of doing that is, it takes time, it's hard, it, it takes a persuasive salesman, it takes, I don't know, dancing girls, I don't know what it takes, but it takes something that isn't exactly happening right now in wildlife conservation. And I just, I, I beg you to consider other things. I, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily internet things, maybe, maybe funny hats, you know what I mean? I, it doesn't matter what it is, it's that something that works. You know, like imagine, I mean, it's hypothetically, um, I, I, I remember in my childhood there was the, there was the 1970s uh, recycling conservation thing with the crying Indian. You remember that commercial with the crying Indian? Mm -hmm. Okay, once that guy started crying, I never want to throw anything away again. <laughs> I always wanted to recycle because he loved the land and it was being spoiled by careless, thoughtless losers who didn't even know what they were doing. You know, that was the kind of feeling I got from watching that, that, that commercial. That was very powerful to me as a kid. I was like, oh, that, you know, I was 10 years old then. I was like, oh, I, I must always be perfect with the plastic here, the aluminum. You know, I, it, I didn't need to be scared. I just, I wanted to be worthy of his respect. I felt like I was part of the ones that had betrayed him. So, you know, just an image can be huge in someone's life, okay? I think, I think you know, we can share images. We can help you do that. We can, we, can, we can do a lot of things. But basically, you have to tell a convincing story that the story on its own convinces, converts people to your point of view, convinces them to take inconvenient actions, convinces them to give up something else. You know, one of the, I mean, well, this is dangerous for me to say this in public, but it's a polit personal political opinion, but one of the big lies of modern politics is that somehow some elected guy or woman or whatever can give you something. I was like, I'll give you, I saw an article about President Obama, he said, he's going to lower the cost of education. Well, you can't lower the cost of education. I mean, whatever it costs is what it costs. He can't, like, make it cost less. He can make you pay less for it, but it didn't change the cost of it. It meant that he's going to take money from this guy and make him pay for it, or not have hospitals. Or, you know, it is, the money to pay for it has to come from somewhere, right? It doesn't, you don't actually lower the cost of it. We live in this world where people talk about pretense, about as one side, you know, you can have more of something and not have less of something else. The truth is, you can't. And so since you can't, people that run these countries know that if they protect the animals and people say starve because there's not enough food, even though they shouldn't be taking that food, they're going to be the ex-president real soon. I mean, things like that. I mean, th these are real issues. So, you know, we work with heads of state. We work with uh, international illegal fishing, for example, ocean protection, uh, by tracking ships at sea from satellites. We do a lot of interesting things. But none of these things are instantaneously remedial. There, there are, you have a world out of balance that's racing to its own destruction. You have a few hundred thousand concerned people represented by three or four hundred here. It's, 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 it's time to engage the world in its own self-defense. And we're not winning that battle. I, Thank I, I you. Just, I beg you to do your very best. I, I can't do it for you, but I promise you Google will do everything we can to build the tools that would make new possibilities that hopefully you can exploit to win this battle. It's, it's, the world depends Thank on you. Thank you. And with that, I'm afraid we have to wrap it up for tonight. Thank everybody for coming. And our thanks to Michael Jones. Woo-hoo! <laughs> Woo-hoo!